Welcome to Coffee and Conversation. Good morning. Uh, Ada Weinstein is with us this morning. She is the founder and CEO of Trident Wind. Um, and the company is focused on developing uh, deep water offshore wind energy. Oh, right. Named it. <laughs> um, and you've been in renewable energy for 20 plus years. Yep. Yeah. I uh, did not start in renewable energy. I actually started in aviation. So this is my second career. Mm -hmm. and after 20 years in aviation, I fell into the ocean. Yeah, it's I got stuck there because uh, along the way you realize what's important to you and energy is very important. And uh, also along the way, I realized that the ocean probably presents us the most opportunity in, in, in energy, any form you want to take. You know, have human life started in the ocean, right? Everything started in the ocean. So it provides food, energy, sustainability. And uh, while I started in renewable energy and something I had absolutely no clue, you know, being in aviation, putting avionics on airplanes and making them, I had no idea about, you know, ocean power industry or anything else, but I studied in wave energy. It was an exciting technology and it still is exciting technology, but I think it's a long way from being commercial. But as you realize what's important and that the energy is there, they are moving to floating offshore wind, back in 2008, which we didn't have technology, it really became something I did next. And so uh, prior to Trident Winds, I was uh, I co-founded a company called Principal Power that developed the technology to be able to talk about offshore wind on the West Coast because our water depth is so deep, so fast. And uh, in 2016, I showed up in California and submitted an unsolicited list request, which is a step you have to go through getting a permit from the federal government. So we are here today in a way because what I did back in January of 2016, I kickstarted the whole process. And now we're looking at potential auction at the end of this year. And hopefully the new bill that will be passed this year in the house will not delay that yeah. much, yeah. but we can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting to see that people finally catching on, which yeah. I did 20 years ago to understand we can't live the way we lived climate has changed. If people continue to deny that, I'm not sure what will change their mind. Uh, but we have to weed, literally, yeah. wean ourselves from fossil fuel. It's just that simple. you know. And uh, we'll, we'll dig into, unravel a lot of what you've said here, because there's so many nuggets of uh, what we want to focus on. We have a lot sure. of founders, entrepreneurs that are at that starting point where you were probably at back in 2008. And, and you know, I want to break down that journey. Okay. Um, but a couple of slides before we jump in. Uh, so most of you know with the SVDC, there are about a thousand SVDCs in the US. We're lucky to have one in Slow that we've been running here for 10 years. So um, we work with small businesses from, well, from startup to small to larger scaling businesses. Um, we provide one-on-one -on -one consulting as well as workshops, trainings. Uh, it's completely free to the business owner. Um, we are funded by the SBA and by the GoBiz office and many sponsors. Uh, and we'll hear a quick um, video from one of our key sponsors, Maynard Cooper, a uh, corporate law firm in Silicon Valley. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamal Al Haj, and I'm a partner with Maynard Cooper and Gale in the firm's San Francisco office. Maynard Cooper is a full service law firm of national reach with over 300 lawyers across 11 offices coast to coast. Our San Francisco practice focuses on advising emerging growth companies and venture capital firms, including with respect to equity management, financings, employment, and intellectual property matters. We are extremely proud to be a Founder Circle sponsor amongst an extraordinary circle of other dedicated philanthropists who recognize the immense value that Cal Poly's Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship bring to the SLO community. We hope that each of you enjoys this upcoming training and workshop and are able to incorporate the knowledge and know-how that will be presented shortly to further help grow, develop, and accelerate your businesses. So actually, this is a Cool, quick little opportunity. We've pre-negotiated packages for people who are seeking to incorporate their legal entities with firms such as Mayor Cooper and a couple others at an uh, incredibly preferential rate is for all available for all of our SBC clients. Uh, so you're literally paying 20%, um, or, you know, 20 to 40% of what the normal rate would be to, to get all that work done if you're setting up um, 
a Delaware C Corp. So anyway, that's something I just wanted to throw in there if anyone is uh, seeking assistance in that. Um, so I, we introduced you at the start and we're gonna dig in. So my first question is you start something back in 2008 and really you've been bootstrapping, right? Uh, and or working with investors for more than 10 years. Uh, actually, actually 20, to 20, 20 started 20 in 2000. So yeah. how, I mean, that is such a giant leap of faith. How do you pull that off when you're starting uh, from, you know, in with technology that is not yet mainstream, far from it. Um, talk to us about the start, how that, that first, <laughs> the first venture yeah or how you first jumped into it and 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 financed it and figured out yeah. how to keep it going until because it's not as if you're getting you know uh 150 clients a year you're getting one you know if you get the one client it's the one and only for a while uh, how did yeah. that work well it's uh it's not easy first thing and it's not for everyone it really isn't when I started in 2000 with this wave energy company, I was a freshly minted MBA and I did work in the industry for 20 years. So I was not only just studying um, an entrepreneurship path, it was in a totally different industry because I literally started from ground zero. So not only do you have, how do you raise money, which I have never done before really, but also how do you get credibility for something you're doing when you have no credibility because that's not the industry you're in, right? So the way it started was more technology was intriguing. People liked the notion, but I don't think anybody at that point really knew what it really does or doesn't mean. And so if you look at 2000, we were still in the peak of the internet days. You know, the theory was you put a business plan on the table, anybody will fund it, right? Wrong. <laughs> because at the beginning of 2000, yeah. um, or rather the, at the end of 2000, beginning of 2001, which is really when we went to market, things were going downhill. They were not going uphill anymore. So because the company was in the energy field, uh, we have the lab called Renewable Energy Lab. It's, by, it's under the Department of Energy. And uh, they run uh, an investor forum every year. At that time, it was fairly small. Now it grew into something really, really big. But for companies that are interested to raise money in the energy field, that would be like the first starting point because all investors interested in energy, especially renewable, will be there. And so in, um, you know, the whole thing kind of came to me and I had no idea what it was. and. And uh, at the end of 2000, before I agreed to even continue with those, the, with the people that develop technology, they kind of said, well, we did it so far, but now we need to really make it happen. Um, if you go back to the end of 2000, you may remember Enron days, you know, it was blackouts, brownouts, you know, energy, mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. energy. And I just happened to drive from Arizona to Seattle, you know, the whole coast. And the only thing you hear were these things. And so as I was thinking about the business model coming out of the business school, I said, gee, well, here's the business model. We need to do wave to wire, literally. Starting from the wave energy and then going to the wire because what you can sell is going to be a product, right? And the product is energy. Anybody will buy the energy here. Look at the market, demand is there. Mm -hmm. Whether you can do it profitable or not, that's your problem, but energy could be sold. Where the people that approached me, they were trying to sell a part of something. The analogy mm -hmm. I draw or, or give is, it's like somebody gives you an engine to the car, but there is no body to the car. There are no roads, there are no wheels, there is nothing, and they were saying, why don't you buy my engine? Because the technology they developed was just that. It's called the power takeoff mechanism, which is a mechanism that converts wave energy mm -hmm. and electricity, but there was no value chain. There were no roads, mm -hmm. there was no manufacturers, there was mm -hmm. nothing in between. And so when I thought about it, I said, well, you can't sell that, which is why they couldn't do it, but you can sell energy. So going back from energy to the wave, you then have to lay out all your value chain pieces. And so when, when we got together, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I when, you said needed... when we got together, was it with the tech people? You, yeah, the, the tech, tech people, people like, we got so together the at the end. That's the right. Tech. They approached me and said, you look like, it looks like you know 
what you're doing from the business side, we have this technology help us to make this into a business. And, and, and I needed the challenge. It was good for the world. And I said, well, why not? Of course I can do it, right? I just came out of the MBA school. Of course I know how to do it, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> so we put the business plan together, which made a lot of sense to me. It really did by the book, you know? <laughs> and then we went to this first investment forum, which was in March of 2001. And we got shredded to pieces by the investors. And it took me a year and a half to figure out what was wrong with the business model. And what was wrong with the business model is it was combining risks, which investors don't like to combine. If they invest in technology, that's one set of risk. If they invest in projects, that's another set of risks. But they are very different in their return profiles and what they do and whatever. You don't know that. Nobody teaches you that in the MBA school. That's just not known. But that was the problem. The business model that made a lot of sense based on everything I knew, and I've been in the business for 20 years, made no sense to the investors. But once you figured out what was wrong with it, then you can focus on what needs to be done. But we were in the United States. United States doesn't really invest in, in technologies for generation. Um, at that time, most of the investments were going into solar, not even batteries yet. It was mainly solar. And so for us to raise money in the United States became impossible because prior to that, uh, in the aviation industry, I worked, you know, in the international area arena, it didn't take me much to go to Europe. It literally mm -hmm. did. And going to Europe, to European Commission, which has a lot more money and a lot of more structure to fund this new technological development became what we had to do. The rest is really, literally, we got a little bit of money from Denmark and a little bit of money from UK and a little bit of money from Sweden and a little bit of money from Portugal. Scrounging this little by little in Ireland, we're able to at least demonstrate what technology can do. Um, and then how, how, so you're working with these European countries, you're based in the U S what's their stake in it? How, uh, their stake is in technology because they see it as if you develop technology will be worthwhile and beneficial to everybody. And the way European commission works, when they look at funding, they look who is doing the work. So you have to work with the European companies to do the work, but in general, as long as the project is benefiting somebody within the European Commission sphere, you can get the funding. And we were able to get quite a lot of money from them and to get it developed. And then eventually uh, there was an Irish investor that liked the whole notion of wave energy and he bought the company. But along the way, just to be, you know, show you how they're disorganized, I was approached by European Commission to set up a, Ocean Energy Association, because they said, look, we're funding our PhDs, but you need really to become an industry. So go set up this association. I said, you want me, an American, to do this with the Europeans? Is that really what you want me to do? And the guy said, yeah, just go do it. So I did. In 2005, I, uh, I, I founded uh, or you know, I established a European Ocean Energy Association, it has now grown, obviously, to something a lot bigger. 2005, I left it in 2010, so I was there for five years as a first president. Um, but part of the way, or along the way, we got about a quarter of a million dollars to do road mapping for what it will take the wave energy to become reality. And that's when I said, whoops, this is not going to happen in my lifetime. Yeah. I better go find something else. <laughs> but, you know, you learn these things as you go because technology is exciting. You know, if you look at how much money uh, the world has spent in the wave energy, it's going to be mind boggling. There's 5,000 patents and not one so kilowatt that's, okay, is going let's into the bridge. Pause for a that's pretty mind boggling. You, you spend nearly 10 years on a technology that you believe in. You come to the realization that it's not necessarily feasible within the next 20 years. And did a and yeah, sold the company. Did a massive pivot, right? Oh yeah, you better exit as quickly yeah. as you can. Once you there realize. is one thing. There used to be a, a group called for, a, a Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But it was a very good group where you come to kind of like this and you hear the stories and experience and whatever. And it was one story and one advice that stuck in my head forever and beyond: merge early and often. Merge early and often. 
when the opportunity comes, take it. It's not good to be there tomorrow. Just that simple. So when the opportunity came, somebody said, hey, I'm interested. I said, let's go. And I sold the company. And this company that I had was the only one actually in the whole wave energy arena that actually had an exit. Others died because they were too greedy and they didn't want to do it because the, the guy. So you have to be realistic. And it was easy for me to be realistic. I was not attached to technology. It is very hard for technology inventors to move away from their baby. Mm -hmm. I did not have that problem. That was a benefit because I purely looked at it very clinically on a business side of things. It didn't make sense. Find the way out. Mm -hmm. You cannot be attached because if you are attached, you will fail. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally that simple, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult. That's why I'm saying entrepreneurship and startups are not for everybody. Through the first company, because raising money was so difficult, um, we had to do everything possible. And I did not get paid for six years. And that's true. I max out every credit card, then she recycled them and everything else. But that's what you have to do. And when the opportunity was there, you know, I took it. Then everything worked out. We didn't make a huge amount of money, which is fine, but we made enough for me to start the next company. Because once you've got bitten by an entrepreneurial bug, it's a virus. It's not treatable. That's it. You're gone. So, You're gone. Uh, I, I know. I mean, I'm loving just talking with you, um, but I know you have slides. So um, what would you prefer? Should we dive in? Or do we keep saying this? Well, it's really up to you because yeah. this is going to talk about offshore wind. This is what's coming literally on this shorts. Yeah, starting next year, we're going to be doing work. So if you want to know what's coming, this is what it is about. This is not about technology. In fact, the next baby that I created, which was Windflow, is all the way at the end, just to show you. This was the result of the next company. Once I sold the wave energy, I went, you know, right back and say, okay, now we do this. And again, the United States, no money for development. Now there is money for development, but I can take credit to actually creating the program at DOE to do it. We had to go back to Europe. And it's the knowledge of who was interested in what and where the money is and timing is everything. You know, we're able to raise money in Portugal, small country, right? Out of all countries, US versus Portugal. Portugal invested money in the new technology that came from US that they had no clue how it would work, but it was a reputation. Now I had reputation. I didn't have to prove that I know what I'm talking about because people knew that and they trusted that if I bring something, it will work in a day. So and it's all very well. That's succeeded. a question we talk about a lot. So I'm going to stay on this thread if everyone's okay with that. It is, uh, we will get into the slides because I think sure. that we're all very intrigued by the technology as well. Um, <clears throat> but something that comes up a lot for our founders is uh, how, do, how you build traction to validate what you're doing. What kind of traction do you have to showcase to uh to get investors on board and so you you're saying reputation was key to get the, that the first second round one. you know for that the second, second company one. to right. get those investors so reputation is a form of oh, traction and validation what what else helps move the needle with those investors um well don't go to investors that don't invest in the field that's useless because they're very focused they all have well i shouldn't say all you know, angel investors would be the best to start with. And that's how we did the first company. And, you know, it was with an angel investor that said, I love technology, you know, this is great. So mm -hmm. it's more emotional rather than anything rational. else, yeah. rational. Yeah. Uh, when you go to VCs, they're going to be very precise in what they can invest mm -hmm. in and what returns they're looking for. And VCs are normally going to be investing only in something that does not require a lot of money and can be taken to the IPO. Generation technology infrastructure cannot go that route. So those VCs were totally out completely. Then you have strategics. Strategics are, um, I would call them, you know, it's a necessary evil. And the reason why it's a necessary evil is because um, they will invest because there is something in it for them. It's not 
they will not invest because it's something for you. They will invest because they see some opportunity for them, for whatever it's going to be. Isn't that always true? Absolutely. In any investor, not as you just strategics, right? I mean, there's always either well, of course, in ROI, of course, of course, of course, in, of course, yeah, yeah. of course, that's true. But at the same time, angels will want to make a return, but they will make a return or they will look for the investment for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Like there are some VCs that do triple bottom line, right? Where they look mm -hmm. for social benefits, for climate benefits and return. Return always is important. What I'm saying, traditional VCs will not have those triple line requirements. They will go strictly for return and strictly for IPO. These type of technologies don't even fall into that sphere. And that's why it was not even possible to go through the VC route. So it was only government financing or strategics. And, um, uh, and things were not happening in the United States. They're just starting to happen. So we had to go to Europe. So everything had to be done in Europe. We never raised any money from venture capitalists. They were just not there because it's not, it's not the product mm -hmm. they will invest in. Okay, that's just that. And so that leaves you with strategics and strategics there because they saw an opportunity, but they come with you know a lot of strings attached. So then it becomes if you want to get it done, just realize what you're going to get, and what they're going to get is not going to be IPO returns. So it kind of like well, I'm going to start something, you know. And the, and, the, and the eyes rolling and the dollar signs, right? I'm going to go to market and I'm going to get valuation, whatever. Don't even think that way. If that's the way you think, just just get out because it's just not going to happen. You have to be realistic. Your Can Facebook you happens on once, like, yeah. uh, uh, Tesla happens once. It doesn't yeah, happen all the yeah. time. Yeah. So you, what you're saying is if, if your only motivation is to get to the crazy valuations and it's- Don't even start. Not, yeah. Don't yeah. even start. Yeah. Tesla was uh, Tesla had a lot of trouble at the beginning raising money, mm -hmm. you know, with their first cars. And uh, 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 I know the investor uh, that did it and they said we weren't sure if it was going to make it. So even companies that succeed eventually uh, may not make it. And it's not a given that your exit will happen, or that you will make the money you want to make the money, or that there will be something that you're going to see tangible soon enough. You know, look at the time that it took Tesla to really get traction. It was 10 years. For any technology development, doesn't matter which technology you mm -hmm. take, unless it's software, maybe. Anything dealing with the hardware, it's a 10-year cycle. You have to develop a prototype. You have to demonstrate mm -hmm. it. You have to get field testing. And that's a 10-year cycle. Mm -hmm. But I can say that once, you know, once I realized that wave energy is just not going to happen in my lifetime and move to floating off the wind which was almost like why do we not have any washer wind on the west coast what is it too deep what do we need for deep waters we need floating has anybody done it no well fortunately you meet people along the way and when they come back and say oh by the way i have this idea how about we put a turbine on this mini oil platform and hmm, interesting let's do it and literally that's how it started we had a drawing it was on the you know on the screen it wasn't on the napkin but that was the beginning and the second time around, obviously, you know where to go, you know what you're doing, you understand better the business model that does and doesn't work. Um, uh, and that was a much shorter period of time. So while it took me six years to exit first time around, the second, and without even, you know, raising enough money to cover the payroll, the second time around, we were able to raise money immediately enough to start things the right way and mm -hmm. so that resulted in a product um uh that is now really uh has the most installed capacity around the world so you did you developed the product uh have you either licensed the technology for other companies to use it and install it elsewhere or do you have how what's what well the i left the company that? because we didn't agree on the business model okay. with a strategic investor <laughs> And the reason is that, you know, you need technology, but you also need to market pool. And since there was no market for floating offshore wind, part of my business model was to do what I call product plus. So product being a technology piece, right, that enables you to do it, but plus being you initiate projects because you need a market pool. 
And they didn't believe in that because they were utility, the traditional thinking. I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to stay with the technology only. I said, all right, guys, that's your prerogative and that's fine, but we need a market. And so I left the company in 2015 and they stayed as technology only. And I think in the long run, they will probably lose because you need the product to be not just licensed, mm -hmm but built, warranted, and all that stuff. And they didn't want, they didn't see it that way. They wanted to do it just licensing. But in reality, remember they are strategic. Why did they do? Because they wanted it. So they wanted to preserve the product for themselves, which is not what you want. You know, you don't want to be a captured product, right? But that's exactly what they're doing. They're now initiating project and they're using the product in their projects. But that's not how products work. Product needs a much bigger market. But again, strategics, that's why I'm saying mm -hmm. the necessary evil. For certain technology, you have no choice and it will be strategics, but they're also going to have a very different viewpoint of what they want because they want it for themselves first. And they may not want like a case with this one to share it with others. They just want it themselves. And that means you can't get the valuation. You can't do what you want to do just because you can. So what came after that? So you left. You... I started trading wind. Okay. okay. Like I said, okay. once an entrepreneur is an opportunity, you're done. There is no way back. So this was <laughs> the third. This is the third one. That you That's right. Yeah. This is yeah. the third one. And now I didn't have to really look for investors. They came to me, literally. So credibility, 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 experience, reputation, visibility, all of that changes dynamics. And then, you know, I came and I said, we need the market. I had a vision back in 2008 that we're going to have a floating offshore wind on the west coast of the United States and I can say that is here I completed that vision we now have all three states working on the on the floating offshore wind that's incredible um I, I do want to take a second to open up to questions uh otherwise we can just keep going and if there's any questions online in the chat okay I'm curious to ask you how do you I'm going to repeat the question real quick because we have the mic. Uh, how do you quantify the energy? The, benefit, the benefits. The benefits uh, yeah. of uh, wind energy. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are multiple benefits. You start with why you're doing what you're doing. First, it's climate, right? It's renewable energy versus um, fossil fuel. And I have some slides to show you what it does to California and how it compares to other sources of renewable energy. Second is going to be um, uh, benefits to population. You know, this is a new industry, it doesn't exist. With any new industry, you're creating a new industry, which means jobs, which means utilization of resources that otherwise would not be utilized and so on and so on. For me, uh, besides the monetary reward, and I look at it very simply, I'm not looking for gazillion dollars i'm looking to be recognized for what i do and i want certain return but that's not the driver you cannot motivate me with money you can motivate me like this way that you guys did with something that was not proven like i needed the challenge it was international it was good for the world and that's all it took literally and so it depends what your motivation is that's why i continue to underline money cannot be a motivation for what you do. It has to be something else because if it's only money, you're going to fail. You're going to be very frustrated because money is not going to show up on the table. And I also knew that through my prior, uh, prior, prior 20 years of work that um, while aviation industry is great, interesting or whatever, uh, it wasn't really helping the climate. It was actually hurting the climate. And one approach is to go into fuels and figure out how to do, but that's not something I could do anyways. And so it was more looking at how can I contribute to what I can while I'm here to at least um, change the attitudes and move us away from fossil fuel utilization. Money was not a driver, never. In fact, I didn't really 
uh, it was my brother, it was my late brother that pushed me out of the you know corporate environment saying, this is what you really need to be doing. But once you did, once I started, there was no return back. There's just not. And, when and you then, say, and, so let, and, hold on a second. Yeah. And then you, as you go through, you may not see what the future looks like. And I have no idea what the future looks like, but I do know that looking back at the experience that I will figure it out. When somebody asks me, how are you going to get there? I say, I have no idea. And that's true. I just know what I'm trying to get to. And the rest of it will be kind of in between. And then when I look back, I say, well, how do you do it? Because it's in your gut. It feels right. It's no longer brain. It's more feeling. Does it feel right or wrong? Whatever you do. Sorry. No, no, that's great. It's so good. Uh, I wanted to talk about what you just mentioned about your brother. So, what, what was, uh, what, what did he see uh, that was happening? Where he, he was sort of your. It sounds like a mentor uh, that mentored you out of this. Like he didn't mentor, he pushed me out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was an intervention almost. <laughs> what he, um, uh, I'm an engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, and I've been, you know, in the industry for 20 years, right? He was an engineer as well, um, and he worked for a similar company. But what he didn't like, and at least what he was doing, that he was putting ideas. For the benefit of others and to him it was the wrong thing to do because he wasn't benefiting you know large corporation benefiting right you go and invent something who holds the patent you don't hold the patent the company holds the patent so he didn't like that part and so he left the big corporation uh much much earlier than i did and then we were and then he wanted to do this a business so we wrote proposal and he saw what i could do and he said you got to get out. You got to get out. I said, no, you I'm not ready. Yeah. Well, we, I, we, we wrote one proposal. We didn't yeah. get it. We were the second one, you know, the second, uh, the runner up, okay. I should say. Um, but it was something on his mind all the time. And so once he understood what the private business can be, then it was almost like his mission to push me out of the corporate world. And he succeeded um, uh, when things kind of happen and things happen that beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And when it was there, it was like, it was a good opportunity to say, don't go back, go this route. Mm -hmm. And then when this wave energy presented itself, then he became a part of it too. And that's how it kind of happened. Yeah. So yeah. you don't know what will happen, but the point becomes literally that statement that I made a long time ago, where it says merge early and often, it's not necessarily merge early and often take opportunities when they come in front of you that's the important piece mm -hmm. and those opportunities if you want to do something you will gravitate to whatever it is that you want to do it's in your subliminal unconscious mind you don't know that because you're not thinking it's in unconsciously you will know man i want to be doing this i didn't know that you know, I had no clue about anything that I'm doing right now in 2001, zero. I had no training in ocean hydrology. I had no idea about hydrodynamics. I know, knew about nothing about power industry. My electrical engineering was high frequency processing with voltage being 28 volt DC maximum. So it's like, now we're dealing, you know, with 500 kilowatt volt lines and gigawatts of energy. So, being an engineer gives you the base for just about anything and you can figure out mm -hmm. anything. And so I was, you know, happy that I had what I had because it allowed me to learn. Now I know how all these things work and mm -hmm. I can talk intelligently to the engineers and to the business people. And so it became you, important. You have an incredibly rare capacity and personality, right? It's so rare to meet engineers who also are uh, to be able to do business. People. Yeah. And so I think you're the an incredibly you have that rare combination that really takes it. To well, the but that really comes with a realization that technology is an enabling factor. Mm -hmm. It's not means to the end. And so if you don't know the business side of things, you may be the most brilliant engineer. But that's not business. And so if you want to be in business, you better know business. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and and again, if you are too personally attached to technology, that's not good either. Mm -hmm. So inventors 
are fine, they need it, but I do not want to be an inventor because mm -hmm. that becomes too too dangerous. Too, yeah, as you mentioned, too. too yeah. So we do have one question, and maybe we will jump in and start looking at some of the slides. Uh, this is from Stephen Frank. What was the name of the uh, U.S. government entity for energy funding? I think it was DOE, you said? Uh, I think he's talking about the NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That runs an investment forum yeah. for startups in the renewable energy field. Yeah. That NREL is under the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. but it's a separate lab, same as Sandia or, you know, uh, Pacific Northwest Energy Lab. That one is... Renewable Energy Lab in uh, Golden, Colorado. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's dig in. Okay, so we're going to talk about offshore wind that is coming to the shores of Central California. I am the guilty one. I'll admit it. I'll take a credit or blame. Pick one. Doesn't <laughs> matter which one you want to take. Okay, I do have a clicker yeah. here. Okay, uh, uh, let's see. So you notice on the bottom here, it says Castle Wind, right? Castle Wind is a joint venture between my company, Trident Winds, that I established in 2015 for the purpose of kickstarting California and other places like Washington. Oregon is already, was already on the way. And the, partner, the other partner is Total um, Energies, which is a large oil company. While back in 2015, 2016, uh, it was still possible for maybe entrepreneurs to start something like that. It is no longer possible because we moved away from you know startups to very large companies that need to be investing. Projects of that nature or a gigawatt of installed capacity in the ocean will cost somewhere around $3 billion. So you can imagine to obtain that type of financing, you cannot be a small startup. That's just not. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just, you know, reality of life. However, there is still opportunities for technology development to make it more expendable. Right now we have a lot of limitations and we'll talk about them in a minute. So I thought I will give you an overview of the process um, uh, the, uh, uh, of what it takes to get permits to be able to even do the design installation. What is the value of Russia Winter, California? Uh, what does it mean to San Luis Obispo, to this county, what it can derive from it, and what is floating offshore wind? Um, so I, I put it in that way, unless you want me to flip it, I can do that too. We can go backwards, um, because if you're interested to see what technology looks like, you know, we can start with that, or we can just go that way. I don't care. Uh, yeah, let's just go in the order, and it'll be, it'll be like, maybe like what, confusing. Which way? In the order it's up. Okay, I that's fine. Here, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So the area where we can install offshore wind off the coast of just about anywhere along the West Coast is going to be in federal waters. Um, the state waters uh, only extend three miles out. And uh, especially in California, just about the whole coast is going to be marine protected areas. So very little space is available to really do anything. And when you are closer to shore, you have a very high degree of biodiversity. There is a lot of shorebirds, there's a lot of um, uh, small plankets, there is a lot of kelp forest. You know, you are closer to shore and the environment is very different than it will be further offshore. So while you can look at the ocean and say, that's a huge space, there is a lot of places there, right? Actually wrong. When you start looking at the maps, you will see that there is a lot of conflicting uses of space. There is so much happening in the ocean that to find area that will have the least amount of conflict is very challenging. So the process is manage the permitting process and the ability to get the license to build and install is managed by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management under the Department of Interior. The abbreviated, as we call them, BOEM, uh, has only jurisdiction to lease because the ocean floor beyond three miles of the state belongs to the federal government, can lease that ocean floor to project developers as long as that area is not a marine sanctuary, national monument, or national park. BOEM has no jurisdiction in those three areas. Now, who does? It's NOAA, National Atmospheric and Oceanographic Administration. 
And so if you want to do something in like an offshore wind in the sanctuary, you don't deal with Boeing, you deal with NOAA. Two different agencies under two different departments, Boeing on the Department of Interior, NOAA on the Department of Commerce. You may have heard about the designation or yeah, a process of designating of a Chumash, National, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, which was proposed to be designated um, uh, from the south end of Monterey Bay Sanctuary all the way through Channel Islands. So that whole coast could potentially be a sanctuary. And that could present an issue of offshore wind development. In fact, serendipitously, I submitted, I came to Morro Bay the first time, it was in July of 2015. That same month is when uh, a nomination for the Trimash Sanctuary was submitted. Yeah, they submitted it for the third time or the 20th time or whatever time it was. It was not the first time, but they did. So it was literally one on top of the other. And, and, and I, you know, I did point out to the state that if that happens, if the sanctuary is designated, that basically takes that whole section of the coast completely out of consideration for human development. So the process is very long because it's, uh, it's open process. In other words, whatever documents get submitted, they go through the public reviews. It took a long time to get us here because we did have four years of kind of no offshore wind development during the Trump administration. And so while things started right before Trump came to power, everything kind of stopped. Now, why did it stop? We have a lot of conflict of use of space and the biggest conflict of the Department of Defense. You may not imagine what happens off the coast, but a lot is. And there is a, a military training range called Point Magoo Training Range, uh, which spans um, effectively from the uh, from the south end of Monterey Bay Sanctuary all the way from through Vandenberg. That is that whole section is a military training range, and uh, and it's not just training; it's testing and training. So they test radars, they test munition. They test a lot of stuff that you may or may not know about. And also there is aircraft testing. So that is all effectively used by Department of Defense. So during Trump and the administration, it was almost impossible to negotiate with the Department of Defense. And that's why we, in a way, you know, nothing was happening for four years. But now with the new administration, um, uh, Biden administration has a goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And three gigawatts or actually more, maybe even four gigawatts could come from California. Practically, it's probably going to be three to four. Reason being that while in central California, we have access to transmission lines, there are no transmission lines in Northern California to speak of beyond 150 megawatts, which is all you can deliver there. And so it's going to take at least 10 to 20 years to build new transmission lines. And that's why it's not going to fall within 2030 period, unfortunately. So the process with the numbers that you see on the, on the scale over there, <clears throat> right here, these are years, okay? This is how long it takes. So where we are, we are right around here. We're expecting the auction by the end of this year. And once the auction occurs, then the project development starts. But we are right before that. So let's the, clarify auction. So, auction, right. Yeah. Auction is when the government conducts an auction to sell the rights to develop uh, or to sell the lease to develop a project to a company. In, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, they, they held so-called multi-factor auctions where money plus some other attributes like a community benefits agreement or power purchase agreement had a certain amount of value, and then they take that value and discount it off the final bid. So when you have two companies bidding, you know, if one has those attributes, then effectively that price will be lower than the other by whatever those credits are going to be. During Trump administration, that all got thrown out the window and the projects or the auctions that were held, which was I think one or two in on the East Coast, were money only. And the way it goes is the Boeing establishes the minimal price, and then they call it so-called the bonus bid. 
And so the bonus bid is what your pricing is. Companies like Equinor, BP, Shell, they basically say, why should there be any credits? You know, it should be money only, nothing else. In fact, I'll go through, you know, what happened recently and you yourself can go and read their comments compared to other people's comments. But the bottom line, they continue to say, there should be, you know, money only, nothing. Because Oxla, which is the Outer Continental Shelf Act, which is a law that drives what's happening in, in, in the ocean, basically says that Boeing can lease the ocean floor through the auction, but it has to have a fair return to the taxpayers. Because the taxpayers are the ones that really own the ocean floor. You know, it's the U.S. government, right? But there is no definition what the right return or what the fair return is. And yet Boeing federal regulation does provide for those multi-factors where the factors could be benefits to a community, advancement of the project because there is less resistance or whatever. And so since 2016, Castle Wind has been quite proactive in campaigning and saying that for California in particular and Central Post, especially, the auction has to be multi-factor auction. And what where we are right now, the proposed sale notice has been published on uh, May 31st. The common ticket period closed on August 1st. And I can give you a link where you can go and read the comments. And you will see that majority of the comments, including the state agencies, did suggest and did um, uh, are suggesting to Boeing that they should run a multi-factor auction and they should take in consideration community benefits agreement, especially with the disadvantaged communities, uh, workforce training and development. And what Castle Wind did since the beginning, since 2016, we worked very closely with the fishermen because fishermen are going to be the most impacted community. You know, that is their workspace, right? Even though the ocean floor and the water, you can say, belong to the government or to the taxpayers. That is where they make their money and they feed us, right? And so they will be an effective community. And so as a result of that, you know, we do have things that we put in place for the fishermen to, to address the potential impacts of offshore wind, but the others have not. And so now you have this disparity between industry players saying, well, we didn't know we had to. And you're right, they didn't because the law doesn't say so. And so we encourage Boeing to use that correctly and put it as a precedence going forward that people need to start do pre-development and working with stakeholders very, very early on, much earlier than the auction. But, you know, big oil companies like BP and Equinor say, no, why should we? We'll just pay our money and that's it. So this is the process, okay? And what you're going to see next uh, probably, I would say September, October, there will be a final note, final sale notice issue. The final sale notice is going to say, here are the entities that are qualified to participate in the auction. Here is the format how we're going to do. And until that comes out, we don't really know how it's going to be. But when it happens, then we will know that within 30 days after the final sale notice, we're going to have an auction. And that auction may happen this year, or it could be delayed because the um, um, inflation, what is it? What is that act? I write, it's a, uh, what? Right, the Inflation Recovery Act. There's a lot of things in there, and especially relative to offshore wind. And those elements, um, and Senator Manchin is the one that brought this in, and that's how, and that's what kind of unlocked that whole bill to move forward. He basically demanded that leases for offshore wind would be done at the same time as the government issues leases for oil and gas drilling. And so now there is a provision there that says Boeing cannot issue a lease until they have issued not a lease to oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So the question is going to be, can they time-wise do what has to be now be required by law? And we're assuming that the bill will pass house tomorrow and that may delay the timing. Yes. Is that like in the same state or, you know, like mm. have one permit 
California. No, it's not California. It's United States. It's, it can be anywhere. So it could be a lease, oil and gas lease in, in, in the Gulf, but it needs to be equivalent acres. There is a number of acres that has to be included, and there is timing. Does that frustrate you in the sense of, you said you're wanting to move away from fossil fuels, and here you are yes. having to, to be able to do what you want to do, you actually have to support. It's politics. Right. Yeah. I can be frustrated about everything. I can be depressed too. You know, I can be really, really aggravated if I really paid a lot of attention to everything that's happening. And you can go crazy, totally. Yeah. yeah politics are politics and they will impact you. Yes. Well, I, I was just going to say, let's say you win the auction and then we have an election. And that can put everything on hold again? No, no, no. Once the auction, well, I shouldn't say no, no, no. Once the auction has been conducted and whoever holds the lease, mm -hmm. now that's a legally binding agreement. The government cannot take it away unless you screw up something, right? Mm -hmm. But look at that timeline past the auction, right? The recite assessment plan and surveys. Before you start the surveys, you have to write the plan, and you have it approved. The approval depends on Bowen. Depending on who's in the White House, that approval may take years. And that's what we saw during Trump administration, where projects were basically not moving because nobody was approving any plans. In fact, Vineyard, which is the first project that is now starting construction, they had to withdraw their construction operation plan because Trump administration was going to reject it. It was better for them to withdraw it and then resubmit right after the new administration and now the project is you know, approved and they're going through. Politics does impact what you do, especially if you're relying on the federal government. Uh, but there is no option. You know, the ocean belongs to the federal government. So in, in light of that uh, long timeline, is in, the, in parallel to that, um, is your tech team, are they improving on the technology? Or are you still uh, doing work at that level? Or is, it, or is that just a, you know, not where your energy is, is well spent. Project development is not technology development. Yeah. I don't develop technology anymore. Technology will come from the shelf, so to speak. Ah, I see, right, right. 2018, yeah. 2008, there were two companies that were doing technology development for floating offshore wind. It was Aquanor, which is used to be uh, Statoil, and Principal Power. They installed their device in 2009. We installed our device in 2011. Now, there were two companies, right? Mm. Now you have over a dozen companies okay, okay. doing development of um, floating or wind. So, so you switched to project development. Project development, the number, the market. The technology is there. Technology was there. Yeah. We knew it would work. We knew it created. There was no need to spend time on technology anymore because inventors can do that. Mm -hmm. I needed market. Yeah. And that was my goal in 2008. Make sure that there is a market demand in the whole West Coast of the United States. And now we have it because now every state has initiated process like this for uh, for ocean wind installations. Yeah. So we only have five minutes left. Oh, sorry. Oh no, no, we should have, we should have carved out two hours. Well, let me let me let me just uh, yeah. But well, is there something you want to? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to skip all this permitting. Yeah. I mean, this is basically the timeline that we're going on, but you can have copies oh of gosh, those I slides. Have the same map uh, framed in there. Same map. <laughs> like the see what I <laughs> yeah see see what I mean by too many conflicts. This pink line is the Point Magusi range. Wow. This this squiggly lines are, are cables. Then you have Monterey Bay Sanctuary over here, and then you say, where am I going to fit it? Well, this is all we could get. And then there is always essential fish habitat and all the other things. But I'll just finish up with, okay, you wanted to know what is the benefit, right? Somebody asked him to ask the question. This line right here is the offshore wind. The yellow line is solar. This line is onshore wind in California. And then this line is out of state wind. As a resource, it's the most stable and the highest capacity factor resource. That's just from the resource point of view. What it means in numbers to the St. Louis Obispo County, this was a study that done by Cal Poly. 
by Professor Hamilton. And basically it was said, we also need a port somewhere in Central California because we can't really tow these things very far away. And if the port is constructed somewhere, and if we install three gigawatts of offshore wind, this is what it will mean to St. Louis Obispo County. These are not small numbers. This has become an economic engine for the next 50, 60 years, literally. And this is just the beginning because there are certain technology limitations, in particular, water depth limitations. We're right now you know, putting those things with anchors, right? Here are anchors. They go to the bottom of the ocean floor, and then you put anchors in the bottom. What if you eliminate mooring? What if you do active control? And what if the things are there without mooring lines going down to the bottom of the ocean floor? You just became depth independent. That means you can go further offshore, right? But with that comes, what do I do with the cable? I have to bring energy back to shore, right? So right now it's what I call an umbilical port. That's a cable back to shore that brings the energy. So the other challenge is stored energy, energy conversion, hydrogen, whatever other sources, but we need to be able to be depth independent and, and shore connection independent. And also that will eliminate a lot of conflicts with the fishing industry as well. So there's a lot of things that could be done in the future. And I think technology-wise, that's what people should be looking at. And this is your MVP. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, but this is what, like I said, you know, 2008, we only had two devices. This one, Windflow, and that one, SPAR, which is from uh, Star Oil. Interestingly, Equinor, now they're called Equinor, now doing design of a semi-submersive, it looks awful similar to this one, but that's besides the point. <laughs> Videos, and then I will let you go. This is the installation of, let's see, I think I need to do this. Yep. There you go. This is from Principal Power, uh, when they assembled uh, three devices for Portuguese coast uh, installation that's operating now. It delivers 25 megawatts of energy. And what's important, is you will see how it gets assembled in the final port, and that's the port that we need in Central Coast. And this is a new way of generating energy and an important step to fight against climate change. Portugal enters in a new era with an international acclaimed solution in the production of offshore renewable energy. The Windfloat Atlantic project formed by a consortium made up of EDP Renewables, ENGI, Repsol, and Principal Power, is the first floating wind farm in continental Europe, just off the coast of Vienna Castel. This floating wind farm will allow the optimization of natural resources and will speed up the commercial deployment of this innovative technology. Windfloat Atlantic is an example of a more sustainable future for mankind with the largest turbines ever installed on floating platforms. The total installed capacity of 25 megawatts will provide sufficient energy to 60,000 people throughout the year. This energy promises an endless source. The potential of wind is immense, and this renewable energy is an essential part of the worldwide decarbonization strategy, free of CO2 emissions. The Windfloat Atlantic project is the future we envision. Our mission has begun, and we will continue to nurture the power of nature to make our planet more sustainable. Windfloat Atlantic. Energy beyond the horizon. Okay, one more yeah. video. One more video. Two minutes. Okay. This is. And, look know, at people this picture. Do worry. They can leave if they have to. Like we. we okay. Okay. Great. That's fine. <laughs> look at this picture. One boat. One tug boat takes to take these units out, and that becomes very important, especially in the United States, because we have a law called the Jones Act that requires all the installation vessels to be. Uh, U.S. flagged vessels, and that is an issue, especially for the East Coast, where the installation procedures are different. But to install floating ocean wind, 
that you're going to do on shore, kind of put it all together on shore, like you saw in the video, you need one tugboat to tow it to the installation site. And that becomes a lot simpler in your in in, in, in here because we have tugboats that are flag uh, US flag vessels. We need to press it again. Uh, let me oh, this yes, no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Scotland stands at the now, This is another project that's already in Scotland. There's a six energy. units rather a than three. Wind farm and they're bigger. Just off this the coast project of in Aberdeen. Scotland generates this 50 megawatts. This is the activities related to a project called maybe Team Garden Project, which eventually right, will consist of several number. Of I'll show you the last one. Now, this is what I meant by the sanctuary. Right. This is a proposed national marine uh, tree mesh sanctuary, and right now the issue is that they allocated or allowed offshore wind, but it's sea locked. Mm -hmm. You can't get to shore, and so what we're asking them to do is basically move the boundary. And I'm suggesting to move the boundary this way, but I think we may only get something like that. But mm -hmm. we'll see. But it is a problem. I've heard that it word is sea lock. Sea lock. Yeah. You know, you yeah. have a landlock with sea lock, right? Here with sea lock. So here is a short video, two minutes, of my third baby. I have two children. This the is my third one. Scale, it's a little bit bigger. It doesn't talk a lot. Installed in October <laughs> 2011, in five kilometers off Agusadora in the north of Portugal, has been successfully tested over the last five years. It has now been proven that this technological solution really? is perfectly it's, reliable. Uh, it was even under sure. adverse yeah. weather conditions, and this was a good storm. At times Very exceeded good storm. 17 meters. In July 2016, the decommissioning phase began and needed only three days of work at sea to disconnect the electric cable and the mooring this is lines from the wind. Worked for five years, but now it's, it. it's a we relatively it simple process it. with less environmental impact and substantially hmm? less cost when compared to decommissioning no. conventional offshore wind solutions. In, Portugal, in uh, UK, as a part of the Kinkerton project. After the disconnecting the power cable that was from the, first the platform, one. This the moorings that anchored it were removed, and, an and the structure was towed 400 device. kilometers to Sinish it Harbor. It was taken out of one body of water because of Atlantic, and put into the North Sea. One local tug vessel with 75 tons bollard pull and less than 500 tons displacement was used throughout this entire process. Tugs like this are commonly available at port facilities around the world. The WF-1 platform was moored at multi-purpose Port Sins Terminal. There, the first step was to do some additional decommissioning work on the wind float structure. This is a reverse operation. Mm -hmm. And then it got reassembled in a different body of water. So. And then in a more complex process to remove the turbine. This was completed and that by means a team that you can repower in two units, days, you know, once using they mobile get to their onshore life, cranes. Uh, uh, and it was the first yeah, time that a wind turbine you can bring them back to shore and repower and put it back again. Because the floating piece, you just need to clean it up. It doesn't change. But, the full process uh, of the decommissioning was conducted and, uh, safely, and quickly, be and without incident, especially if the and did no harm to the seabed. The operation demonstrated that it's possible okay. to unhook. Whoa. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, any more questions? Uh, oh, you're incredible. Every time we talk, I just <laughs> like, I this blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so great to have you. Thanks for thank sharing you. Your, thank you your for your inviting me. Um, a lot more will be happening now on the coast yeah. of California. Really, really glad to have you here this morning. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, uh, a few quick plugins. Uh, August 25th, we have a QuickBooks workshop, beginner uh, level. So if you want to set up your QuickBooks or you have questions about QuickBooks, um, we have a great uh, facilitator who can answer all your questions on on um, what's going on there. Uh, and then 
March, the we have a workshop for retailers, the changing face of retail. Um, Lani Lott is a, a fantastic expert. She supports retail, the retail industry, and helps them figure out how to stay current, adapt to the times, adapt to you know consumer trends and habits that are you know have changed a lot in the last three years. Uh, so come attend that on August 31st if you're involved in retail. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.